Hey there, scary story fanatics! Welcome back to Cleaving Thought from Bone with your host, Sociopathic. Ever feel like you're being followed? Well, some stalkers are more recognizable than others. So, button your suit coats. Tonight, I take you deep into the woods with What Twisted Branches Weave. Why has she been doing this? She thought to herself. She had seen them before. It before. In each one she had created, but each one was becoming more and more elaborate. The school had gotten involved too many times, and the threat of social services loomed in the air. It wasn't her fault. She had no idea where it stemmed from. One of the other kids at school, most likely. Jasmine muttered out loud to herself. It had to be. She recognized none of them. Him. That place. Or those scattered playthings throughout the interior. What's that? Jasmine thought to herself, looking ahead. Darkness. Not an utter abysmal black, completely void of light, but the darkness of night. The glow of the waning gibbous above lent just enough illumination for Jasmine to realize she was in the woods, somewhere. Sticks and leaves below her, slightly damp from the nightly dew that collected here, a thick canopy above so dense only the outlines of netted designs could be seen, contrasted by the minimal light above, sparsely peeking through in patches not much brighter than the darkness below, and blurred by the impositions of nightly perception. She knew the environment, but it was way too dim to comprehend exactly where she was. Jasmine thought for a moment, sitting up on the cold forest ground and rubbing the fog from her head. The last thing she remembered was driving down the road in her suburban. She had just picked up her daughter from school, eight-year-old Carissa. And then? Nothing. She had no memory between that moment of the sunny afternoon and now awaking in some unnamed forest in the dead of night. The how and why concerns left her as she scanned around her, squinting to locate that which she sought, her eyes now slowly adjusting. Carissa, was she here too? She had to find her. The more her mind cleared, the faster her heart began to beat, adrenaline now beginning to take effect. Jasmine stood to her feet. Carissa! Carissa! She called out. Mommy! Was the response she received, off in some unknown distance before her. Jasmine had heard a soft voice that she instantly recognized as her child's. Although she could not see her, she now had a general direction in which to proceed. Carissa, where are you? Jasmine called out as she began to jog. Carissa responded, and due to their frequent communication, it was only moments before she had found her. The little brunette girl was standing in a small clearing under a starlit sky, surrounded on all sides by the encroaching canopy. She was notably frightened, but relieved when reunited with her mother. Do you remember anything? How we got here? Jasmine asked her, now leaning over, close to her face, so as to see the eyes she desired to look into. Carissa shook her head side to side. Jasmine interrogated her further, but it quickly became clear that both were blank-minded regarding the circumstances of recent past and 
present events. Come on, we've got to find a way out of here. Jasmine took Carissa by the hand and began to lead her in a direction selected by random decision, each route offering the same unknown beyond. So, any bearing was as good as any other. It was impossible to get lost in America nowadays, even in the rural woodland expanse of West Virginia, Jasmine reasoned. She figured that if she just went straight, in any direction, that she would likely come to a road sooner than later. She would find no road, but instead a small object almost at her feet after only about ten minutes of walking. It was long and thin, like a stick, but the ratio of stoutness and circumference compiled with its metallic sheen insinuated otherwise. Jasmine and Carissa, led by her hand, deviated from their course slightly so that Jasmine could investigate the object further. Leaning over and reaching with outstretched, willowy fingers, she gripped something cold, solid, and smooth to the touch. Upon feeling the button close to the fatter, distal end, she recognized what it was that she now held, and to her, it felt like a godsend. The treasure she shakily grasped, and sighed with relief upon discovering it functioned, was a flashlight. The woods had become more and more dense the further they walked, and the resulting blackness had become so copious and concealing it was nearly as palpable as squid ink. We have to be near a road. How on earth could we have otherwise gotten here? She reasoned internally, trying to convince herself that salvation could not be too far away. The gloom of abysmal blackness threatened to engulf even the light of Jasmine's flashlight beam, everything outside of its illuminating glow solidifying into a dark that the human eye could not penetrate, no matter how acutely attuned. It imposed itself on the light in this way, almost promising to consume the light as well. Still, the beam from the flashlight cut through the darkness like a knife, revealing only what was contained within the resulting wound. Nothing more but sticks, leaves and the rubbish of shedding trees. The abundance of leaves here gave the crisp night air an almost sweet smell. Had she not been so nervous for the well-being of herself and her daughter, she might have rather enjoyed it. Jasmine had always found the indicative smells of the forest to be relaxing in an almost intoxicating way. She would never feel that way again. The shadows of looming trees in the horizon signified that the dense woodland was not going to abruptly end, revealing civilization any time soon. Thin, spindly branches, as black as the bottom of a well, reached for the heavens above the thick shadow of trunks of their trees winding together in an almost web-like pattern until reaching the top and blooming into blurry black clouds that were the canopy above, silhouetted against a midnight purple sky. The tangled shapes reminded her of that thing, the reason she had driven to Carissa's school in the first place, resulting in her signing her out and taking her home. She had never made it home. There was something, something at the tip of her memory's tongue. She was almost at it, almost within the grasp of her cognition, but the black, skeleton arms of the branches above had begun to spread open their oppressive embrace, the midnight purple backdrop growing larger, overtaking the black clouds of the canopy. There was a clearing. Up ahead, through the thick conglomeration of tree trunks and some heavy underbrush, a clear spot in the forest seemingly awaited the pair. The nearer she got, 
the less she needed the flashlight to notice it. She also didn't need to recognize the shape that protruded upward toward the sky above, a shape foreign to nature, but familiar to the prototypes of her mind, correlated immediately as soon as the point at the top had become notable against the half-light backdrop. It was the pitch of a roof, the point in the center giving it away. Once crashing through the underbrush, Carissa complaining of thorns, Jasmine shone her light on the lonely, desolate cabin that looked as though it hadn't seen a human occupant for an eternity. It was single-floored, surrounded on all sides by tall grass and slightly pitched at an angle, as if one side had begun sinking into the mud even though the earth felt coarse and rigid beneath Jasmine's feet, notable even through the thick soles of her shoes and the plush carpet of grass that she had flattened with each step. Her breathing was heavy now, and she gulped for her breaths, but it wasn't due to her pace. That had been steady. No, it was the feeling that the place had given her, a sudden swaddling of fear that enveloped over her, instant and heavy like water. She crept forward with Carissa, realizing that although there was likely no phone, as she had noticed no lines leading to the cabin, that maybe her and her daughter may find shelter inside, a place to rest and await the arrival of welcomed daylight. Would it be suitable enough for them? She didn't know. They didn't need much to get through only a few hours, and as long as the structural integrity of the place remained intact, it would surely provide what they required. But still, the place gave Jasmine a very uneasy feeling, and she almost had to literally argue with herself out loud in order to proceed. She didn't, though. She didn't speak a word other than asking Carissa to please hush now as she awkwardly negated the thicket of flora and approached the cabin's exterior. The flashlight's beam exposed the details of a front door and the surrounding borders. The cabin was made of wood, but layered boards, thin and rotten, as opposed to logs. Whatever paint remained was sparse and clung to the exterior by some fortune of chance, for nearly the entirety of the wood had been exposed. If it wasn't for these occasional flecks of white, one would never know that it had ever been painted at all. With Carissa's hand tightly held in one of hers, and the torch firmly grasped in Jasmine's other, she shined the light inside. At first glance, she found it weird and out of place, awkward only in its context, but her mind reeled with something, the taste on the tip of her consciousness. Inside were playthings, trucks and play swords, dolls, a smashed easy-bake oven, even a baseball. This image, presented right in front of her, was no drawing. It was tangible, here and now. Carissa hadn't been speaking much in recent months. At first, Jasmine assumed her to just be of mild temperament. The child loved to draw and mostly keep to herself. Jasmine didn't see the harm, until she began noticing something strange. At first, it passed her by completely. She failed to notice anything wrong with the pictures of puppies, kittens, and other such things a child draws, all sketched in crayons of various colors. It wasn't until she found a picture of a little girl, depicted as a stick figure in a triangle dress sitting on a swing, that there was something wrong with it. There was someone else in the picture. It was another stick figure, smaller and near some green smudges that Jasmine knew to be trees, 
Carissa loved to draw trees. But near them was the man. She assumed it to be a man as he did not have Carissa's iconic triangle dress. His head was small, round, and missing the two black dots Carissa used for eyes and the curved line which she used to make smiles and frowns, mostly smiles. A red dot was placed right under where his chin would be over top of the neck portion of the center stick. When Jasmine asked Carissa about it, she shrugged. She asked who it was, and she said, I don't know. Jasmine assumed it to maybe be the girl's representation of her absent father. Damn deadbeat. Can't even send the support money. Jasmine scoffed, putting the drawing in one of Carissa's drawers. As days progressed, Jasmine noticed, once again, the strange figure in the background. In each one, the being was nearer to the girl in the triangle dress. Sometimes Carissa would draw herself on the swings, sometimes in the sandbox, sometimes on the playground. But he was always there, and getting larger on the page, more prominent, the red dot growing into a longer and lingering red line, the bigger he became. Wait a minute. He's not getting larger. He's getting closer. Jasmine wasn't even sure if it was a he anymore. Carissa had drawn the man with way too many arms, long ones that were far too disproportionate for the rest of the man's body. It made him look almost terrible to look at, like some kind of lumbering demon, and less like a man. Jasmine poured through Carissa's drawer in her room, not only looking at the pictures that she had taken note of, she also scanned others, ones from months ago in which nothing had seemed to be abnormal, where she hadn't noticed the depicted menace. Her eyes widened, and she gasped for the breath that escaped her lungs. It was barely noticeable, especially in some of the earliest ones. But he was there, in every single picture. A dot at first, a benign dot that anyone would disregard as a simple child's blot on a piece of paper. But in this same location on each piece of paper, no matter the drawing, the being began to grow into form. Of course, Carissa said nothing, revealing nothing of what she illustrated or why, and it wasn't long after that that the school had become concerned. Carissa had been continuing the pattern in school, only now the drawings contained more. One of the more notable depicted the tall, spindly stick figure with too many appendages in the center of much shorter stick figures, some with triangle dresses, all holding hands. The thing in the middle still had no features, no eyes, no mouth, nothing, just a blank white circle. The smaller figures had received marks for eyes and mouths, all eleven of them. But each of their two eyes were drawn as X's, and their smiles drawn upside down, each frowning in despair. That was the second call. Staring into that cabin, Jasmine recalled the third call, the last call she had received. Carissa had drawn another disturbing picture, and this one had gone as far to frighten the other children in her class. Carissa had drawn a picture of eleven children, all once again frowning and with dead, X-marked eyes, standing in a circle. In the center was that tall, spindly figure with a red line beneath its chin. He was holding a little figure in a triangle dress with a couple of his extra arm-like sticks, but it was terribly wrong. He held her in two pieces. Red crayon was scribbled in a line down from the halves which ended 
at a red crayon pool on the ground at the thing's feet. She was torn in half, and the eleven other figures staring out of the picture with their frowns almost seemingly attempting to pierce Jasmine's soul as she stared back in awe. But there was more. A light blue, almost barely noticeable, with as light a touch by which it was applied, seemed to originate from the center of the halves and towards the thing's blank face. She couldn't describe how she knew, but she just did. She understood that Carissa had drawn this thing to be consuming a soul, her soul, somehow devoured without an orifice. Behind them in the background, but large and comprising the majority of the backdrop, was a cabin. It looked tilted and off-parallel with the borders of the rectangular sheet of paper, and large windows were drawn on each side of a crooked wooden door. Inside were small pictures of trucks, tiny stick figures, and even a baseball. Jasmine's heart sank, plummeting deep into a pit of despair. It couldn't be. She was fearful to turn around, but she knew she had to. She had to see for herself. She had expected it as much as a person in her position could have expected it, but still her mind reeled at the sight, desperately trying to rationalize the insane imagery in the dark before her. She dropped the flashlight in trepidation, shaking violently and uncontrollably in terror, the beam resting itself at just the right angle to highlight the details of the sight before her in such a perfectly menacing way that had her heart been a little weaker, she would have suffered a myocardial infarction right on the spot. It was real. He was real. And although now in the flesh, or whatever he was made of, it looked surprisingly similar to the figure in Carissa's drawings. And even through the paralyzing fear, Jasmine couldn't help but marvel at how accurate her daughter's drawings had actually been. It was mostly man-shaped, and either wore or appeared to wear a business suit, black as night, contrasted by a white shirt underneath, cleaved in the center by a long red tie. But that was impossible, because no one made suits like this. Its arms were far too long for its unnaturally tall and slender body each and every one of them. And yet, the suit appeared seamless, as if tailored for a many-armed man who was far too tall and disproportionate to be human. He stared at Jasmine, and her mind couldn't process the fact that the thing had no face, just a blank canvas of flesh, white, pale flesh where a face should have been. Somehow still, she knew it glared at her. Around him were eleven children, all standing in a circle. They looked to be of differing ages, and from the looks of their clothing, differing times and cultures as well. Jasmine's attempt at reasoning through details halted when each child eyes all black as night, all began to open their mouths as if to scream. Jasmine closed her eyes and plugged her ears. She was too young, had too shitty of a life to have it all end like this. This couldn't be it. Her father abused her, her boyfriend abandoned her upon becoming pregnant, and now her daughter was some kind of freak. She knew what it wanted. She could understand it without words. Later in her life, she would try to reason with herself that it was the thing that did it. But in that moment, it was her will alone. 
and she knew the happenings of her actions. Eyes shut tight. Jasmine made her decision. The following morning rolled in gray and silent, promising to be uneventful and mundane. For Ryan Meyer, it had been a lie. Ryan lived in the deep forest on the outskirts of town. Although the bus would have taken him to school anyway, it was on his way, and Ryan enjoyed the opportunity to spend a little extra time with his seven-year-old son while sharing the morning commute. It was a winding, woodsy road that they had traversed hundreds of mornings before this one, and neither of them expected to see the small, red, and white shape walking down the road in front of them. Ryan stopped the van before reaching the figure. He had recognized the red as blood and hoped to spare his son the sight, if at all possible. Finding the person to be an incoherent, babbling woman, spattered in blood not her own, Ryan decided to call for help. Luckily, he had his cell phone in his pocket and decided to stay with the woman until help arrived. What she said made no sense. He made me do it, I swear, she murmured. Do what? Ryan asked. She simply blurted out. She screamed! He tore her in half! It ate her soul! Ryan looked back towards the van and his young boy within, hoping he would not hear the outbursts. He didn't, though. He was far too consumed with the sight he now beheld out the window, deep in the forest, on the other side of the van. The child reached into his backpack, unzipped it, and pulled out a crayon and a piece of paper. When his dad got back in the van, he would give him a present a stick-figure self-portrait standing in the woods. Ryan was so shaken up that, when he had finally been given the picture later that day, he didn't even notice the small black dot in the woods placed there by his son to represent his new friend whom he saw there. Ryan's son had seen him in all his magnificence, begging for him to come into the forest and play to play with him and the twelve children that surrounded him. Well, when whatever follows you has more than two legs to chase you on, it may be time to make like a tree and leave. Well, maybe that was a poor choice of words. But what's not a poor choice is for you to return here next weekend. And until then, make sure to like, share, subscribe, and turn on notifications so I can catch you all again next Saturday. <laughs>